Good morning, everyone. This is Khoram Nasir from uh, Methodist Debeki Heart and Vascular. Uh, welcome to our weekly Grand Round series. And before I introduce our um, distinguished speaker today, just some uh, logistic for questions if you would like to submit after uh, the, uh, the presentation you can go to pollev.com enter Debeki and respond to the activity or you can text Debeki to 37607 and text in your message so I am honored today to present a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Sanjay Raja Gopalan. He is the Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University Hospital Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. He also directs their Cardiovascular Research Institute and also the Herman Hulstein Chair of Cardiovascular Research. Uh, Dr. Raja Gopalan completed his MD from India and then clinical research fellowships at Emory University and since then he has been extensively helping us transform the perceptions and facilitate the understanding of environmental factors. His lab has been continuously funded by NIH. More than 300 high impact papers including New England Journal JAMA circulation, circulation research. Um, just Sanjay, let you know, we've, I've been privileged to work with you and just this morning we got an acceptance of a paper together, my first paper on environmental risk factors and just to let everyone know of hundreds of paper we have done, this was the first one that I never got a comment back and so I would say kudos to the Sanjay Factor. And in honor of his work, he has been inducted into the American Society of Clinical Investigators. He's also within Association of Professors of Cardiology and additional honors include the William Keating Award from the ACC. So uh, without any delay, I would uh, pass on the baton to Dr. Raja Gopalan and uh, very interested to hear what his thoughts are on the environmental factors specifically related to the cardiovascular disease risk. Thank you, Sanjay, welcome. Thank you, Karam, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be uh, presenting today with you and getting some time to share uh, some information. Privilege to collaborate with you, as you know, and uh, I sort of view collaborations like this uh, where we work towards common goals, in, in particular, you know, in, in helping furthering science around the environment to be, um, you know, a very, a very socially responsible thing to do. So I take a great deal of pride and really appreciate the opportunity to work with you um, on these projects. So let me start by sharing my screen. So I hope you can view this. So, um, you know, I've been working on the environment and, you know, the title of my talk, as you can see, is um, how the environment can be really a corridor for a sustainable um, uh, health solution and really could be transformative in the way we view health in particular. Here are my disclosures. Um, so um, obviously I have funding from the NIEHS, but really have no other conflicts related to this presentation. So let me start with um, a very simple sort of question. Um, what does air pollution, financial crisis, volcanoes, COVID-19, you know, we've been in the, in the midst of uh, perhaps um, singularly uh, transformative uh, moment in our history. Uh, truly transformational in terms of everything that we do as human beings and as, as a civilization. But this has not been the first time. I mean, there have been lots of instances in, in history where it's caused us to pause and reflect on who we are as a species and what we are doing to the planet. So air pollution has been around for a very long time. And here's an image uh, of a satellite remote sensing picture of trans-Pacific um, transportation of aerosols. And this happens, um, you know, quite commonly. And this is in 1998. There are many other instances of uh, large dust storms, for instance, traveling across thousands of miles. Uh, this is just to emphasize the fact that, you know, in, in a sense, we're all connected. And uh, um, just like air pollution can travel long distances, so can volcanic dust, and certainly so can, you know, COVID-19. Another example is the Icelandic volcano that you might remember many years ago, nearly a decade ago. Um, it's, a, it's a mouthful to pronounce, but 
Yala Yakul is the name of the volcano that exploded and caused at that time what seemingly was, you know, uh, a huge amount of damage, but certainly pales in significance compared to what we're experiencing today. And then you obviously have heard of the forest fires, which continues to be a perennial problem, at least in the western part of the United States and certainly in Australia, with serious health consequences. So what they have in common is they all tend to spread. And what they also have in common, obviously, is that they kill people, and they do so primarily secondary to cardiovascular causes. So, you know, if you have a banking crisis, a financial crisis, there's a huge increased uptick in myocardial infarction hospitalizations and death. And so do you, you get the same consequence when you have a volcano explode, explode in Indonesia. And uh, obviously with COVID-19, we're starting to appreciate that patients with underlying risk factors obviously are more prone. And it, it's t turning out that many of these patients actually die of cardiovascular disease as well. So one of the first points that I wanted to make is, and this is often not known to many of our clinicians and even healthcare providers, um, not to mention uh, patients, that the primary reason of the modus operandi of air pollution in mediating mortality is primarily through cardiovascular causes. So as you can see, the most recent exposure mortality models called the GEM models show that uh, roughly 9 million deaths in 2015 are attributable to air pollution, and more than 55% of these deaths are attributable to cardiovascular causes. So a big question, obviously, is, you know, we're living in COVID-19 um, every day. We're living and breathing COVID-19. And the question is, what does it have to do with um, environmental air pollution? And it turns out that there is a big connection. And this is a map showing you spatial distribution of air pollution levels. It turns out that you can do this very easily today. Uh, sitting in your laptop, pretty much uh, you can derive the zip code level or actually, um, you know, sub zip code level, one by one kilometer level, uh, PM 2.5 levels, thanks to satellite sensing technologies anywhere in the world, right? And this is the basis of the global burden of disease estimates for air pollution, because how else would you get air pollution levels in Kazakhstan or, you know, the Gobi Desert? And you can see, uh, you can readily appreciate uh, this congruence, if you will, of high levels of air pollution in the coastal uh, parts of the United States with COVID-19 deaths. And you, you know, as well as everybody else in this country, that the vast preponderance of COVID-19 mortality are along the coastal regions. And in some way, it sort of reflects their pollution levels. And here is the mortality rate ratios. This is a group from Harvard. This is uh, a preprint, not published yet or rather pre, a pre peer review, if you will. And if you look at the quartiles of air pollution, the first thing that strikes you is the low levels. And you have to take this at face value for now because you know I haven't exposed you to what levels constitute low levels, but you have to take my word for it that a value of 10 microgram per meter cubed, which is the fifth quartile of air pollution levels in this particular survey, and this is national annual averages, is extraordinarily low compared to what one might experience, let's say, in New Delhi or uh, Beijing, positively is clean these days. But um, New Delhi, for instance, would have levels, um, annual averages of roughly around 100 to 150 microgram per meter cube. So I think there's a very um, important interaction um, showing you that at high levels of air pollution exposure, the mortality rate attributable to COVID-19 goes up dramatically. And this is for every microgram per meter cube of exposure. So you can, you can see that there is a, a very important relationship between COVID-19. Now, if all of this news is depressing to you, um, you know, a rather um, um, you know, interesting way of looking at this is the silver lining of the COVID-19 cloud, which is one of the consequences of COVID-19 has been um, a global disruption of economic activity. And within just three months, you can look at the graphic here, you can look at a picture of New Delhi, uh, the um, India Gate, where it shows you a remarkably blue sky. And globally, there's been a tremendous decrease in nitrogen dioxide, which is a surrogate for any anthropogenic source. It's a good surrogate for traffic air pollution, for instance. And you could see a dramatic shift. And you know, until COVID-19 hit, you know, we were always convinced that this was a Herculean task. You could not lower air pollution levels, and this is going to require, you know, a tremendous um, act of God. And indeed, COVID-19 comes along and proves to us that this can be done. You can lower air pollution levels dramatically with a switch, uh, with a light switch. 
uh, literally. And there have been a number of estimates. This is one of them. If you look at the global inventory of carbon dioxide emissions, and this goes into the whole aspect of global warming and the relationship of global warming with air pollution levels. And you can see that the decrease in CO2 emissions is by far the largest that this our civilization has experienced. And this just to put this in perspective, you can look at what happened in the Second World War. You can look at all the crisis that we've experienced since the um, 20th century. And you can see that we are, it's anticipated that you might see as much as uh, a 5% drop in um, CO2 emissions. And the immediate question then becomes, well, what does this mean in terms of uh, climate change? What does this mean in terms of global warming? Well, it turns out that the vast majority of CO2 emissions, as you know, is from purely human activity. This is all anthropogenic activity. And if you look at source inventories, looking at specific areas that have contributed to a, a decrease in CO2 emissions, and again, CO2 emissions, one can look at it as a surrogate for air pollution uh, because they're the same sources. And you can see the vast majority of decrease is really from disruption in aviation, certainly in surface transport, industry, and public buildings and commerce because of the usage of power to, uh, to essentially um, you know, switch the lights on and, uh, and get the air conditioning going. You know, power um, uh, consumption also went down, and globally there's a huge decrease in air pollution levels, so much so that people have started uh, wondering about what this might mean for human health. Uh, you have to remember, as I mentioned, the emissions from the same sources that are responsible for global uh, warming, with a few exceptions, because again, there's a cattle factor, because cattle, again, is a huge um, 15 to 20% contributor of global warming. Um, and but the point that I want to make with this is these two are intricately related. And one needs to think about global warming for a moment. If you start looking at it from the perspective of uh, short term emissions, which are primarily uh, the kinds of emissions that we study as uh, air pollution scientists, then this could result in a switch in um, what ought to be done, because if the focus now is in air pollution rather than this very abstruse concept of air pollution where people don't understand it, people say, well, how does it affect me? It brings up all kinds of issues. But if you start to look at the same sources, because it's the same sources, it is ground transportation, and I've highlighted this in uh, red, to show you that 75% of all the black carbon emissions are purely anthropogenic. So we have control over it. And the only way we can start to shift is to really start shifting our uh, subsistence on, um, on anthropogenic sources of fuel. And uh, clearly this can be done as COVID-19 has shown us. So the point that I'd like to make is emissions certainly I think influence climate. But if you were uh, living in certain parts of the country, and I know that in Methodists, you have lots of liberal thinkers, so I don't think I need to provide positive proof of global warming. But if you wanted me to show you convincingly that there is indeed something called global warming, here's uh, something for you. So this is positive proof that you do have global warming. I don't have to show you any other piece of data. Unfortunately, the um, um, you know telemedicine and doing um, a conference via Zoom. Unfortunately, I can't hear you chuckle, but hopefully you are smiling and chuckling at this uh, proof of data. But jokes apart, I think uh, the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, IPCC, provided some very dire estimates of scenarios of global warming. And there are three different scenarios shown here by the red. This is uh, unbridled usage of uh, anthropogenic emissions as if there was no tomorrow. And you can see that there's going to be a, uh, at least a four degree change in um, surface temperatures, which translates into roughly 10 degree Fahrenheit uh, increase in temperatures. And on the other hand, if you were to say completely um, 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 uh, prevent any further increases from year 2000 onwards, you have, a, you have a chance in terms of mitigating the relentless increase in, um, in surface temperatures. Now, the question is, what if we switched off you know, all of the lights, we switched off aviation like we did at COVID-19? So as I said, you know, we, we were successful in reducing uh, emissions, uh, CO2 emissions by roughly 7%. And let's say we hypothesize that we keep doing this every year. There's a COVID crisis every year. Even if you did this every year till 2013, okay, you still can't get past um, 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 catastrophic environmental damage. So 
it tells you the seriousness of the problem. And if you think that COVID-19 was an existential crisis, think again, uh, because uh, you know we have to take dramatic actions in order to, uh, um, to prevent things. So anyways, uh, this, is, this is where I'll stop talking about global warming because it's pretty depressing. But the, but the idea is where we are right here, which is roughly 410 parts per million. And even if you turned off global inventories, we'll have to have a dramatic seismic shift in the way we practice civilization in order to make an impact. So anyway, this is where I, I sort of give you an outline of what I'm going to talk to you about, which is not about global warming anymore, which is really to focus on the environment and how the environment has an outsized effect on cardiovascular mortality and sort of reverses the way we think about health in general, rather than looking at ourselves, looking at what we can do and look around us to see how we can influence cardiovascular health. Spend a little bit of time talking about air pollution mechanisms. And for those of you interested, obviously we talked about uh, COVID-19, but the question is, you know, how does COVID-19 affect air pollution related mortality? Um, you know, and conversely, how does air pollution influence COVID-19? And finally, uh, um, finish off by solutions for mitigating exposure. I I'll have to start, and obviously I use this slide quite a bit. Um, I think the, the first talk uh, about the environment really has to be uh, about this very famous aphorism attributable to Jeffrey Rose, who, as you know, is perhaps Mr. Population Health. He was a um, scientist at the London School of uh, Population, London School of Tropical Health. And uh, as you know, the London School has many distinguished alumni who have been uh, larger than life figures in public health, including Richard Dahl, for instance, or Manson. Uh, but Jeffrey Rose is paraphrased as having said, a large number of people exposed to a small risk may generate many more cases than a small number exposed to high risk. And this is really the central tenet of population health, if you will. So strategies, and this has been a good example for us because, you know, as a society, at least in the West, we've been relentlessly focused on individual solutions. And now the sort of perverse, if you will, in some levels, uh, looking at um, um, personalized solutions for individual health, where really the focus should be around how can you mitigate risk at a population level, and that's going to have the biggest bang for the buck. He also is paraphrased as having said something very prophetic, which I always um, you know, find fascinating, where he said the primary determinants of disease are mainly economic and social, and therefore its remedies must also be economic and social. And this is really a very far-reaching claim uh, 60 years ago when he made it. Uh, medicine and politics cannot and should not be kept apart. So it's a fascinating way to sort of start to examine uh, lasting solutions or population health solutions where in order to make a difference, in order to make transformative impact, as you're seeing right now with COVID-19, this has to be global. This cannot be individual based. I'm not saying that individual solutions are not important. Of course they are. But in order to have um, uh, an impact, especially in the have-nots, I think our strategy should be dramatically different and should be more along the lines of how do you change culture? How do you change uh, perhaps in an environment? So I'll start with this very simple slide. And now we, this is sort of central. Uh, this is not controversial anymore. We know that risk factors contribute to the vast majority of cardiovascular disease. This is inter-heart. There'll be many other studies showing that as much as 90% of the population attributable risk is attributable to modifiable risk factors. It's been shown recently for type 2 diabetes, where you can eliminate type 2 diabetes simply by modifying risk factors. So the, the moral of the story is implementation of what we know, especially preventive strategies, could be an excellent way of reducing premature cardiovascular disease worldwide. Now, the naysayers would come back and say, well, what about genetic influences? And obviously, genetics influences cardiovascular risk. There's no doubts about it. But rather than genes influencing outcomes, um, or rather um, influencing um, cardiovascular outcomes, uh, it's the other way around, where we are finding increasingly that it's the environment that shapes uh, genetic uh, uh, risk, uh, modifies uh, your risk. And this is certainly um, the case with the whole science of epigenetics, where we are learning that uh, the environment is a very powerful modulator of uh, uh, genetic risk. And this is well illustrated in this very nice paper from, um, from Amit Kera, published a few years ago, where in three different communities, Eric, the Women's Genome Health Study, and the Malmo Diet and Cancer Study, uh, fairly robust sizes, they used a polygenic score comprising of 50 known uh, polymorphisms that have been shown to be 
uh, associated with cardiovascular risk in large genome-wide association studies. And when they stratified people according to their genetic risk as low, intermediate, high, and then looked at people who had favorable, intermediate, and unfavorable lifestyles, you can see a very nice hierarchy of risk to show you the dominant influence across genetic risk of lifestyle. And lifestyle in many ways is a surrogate for the environment. It's what we do to our bodies. Uh, and it clearly shows you that regardless of where you live, um, the environment oftentimes uh, trumps genetic influences and can mitigate. So if you, if, you, if you actually practice favorable lifestyle, you can, for the, mo for, for the most part, mitigate unfavorable lifestyle exposures. So it tells you that there's a very intricate relationship between the two, but clearly the environment has an outsized effect. And uh, a person who's at high genetic risk, a favorable lifestyle might be associated with nearly a 50% lower risk of coronary artery disease and an unfavorable lifestyle. So when you talk about the environment, it gets very complex very quickly, right? People start saying, what are you really talking about? Are you talking about my internal environment, which very simplistically, and this is very simplistically shown here as a conglomeration of mood, belief, perceptions, attitude, but again, it's highly complex, to a personal environment that includes your diet, physical activity, sleep, drugs, et cetera. And then you have a social environment, which is all kinds of stuff, food networks, diet, you know, um, governance, technology, how you commute to work, your friends, your family, health services, access to health care, access to food, uh, your relationships. And social environment is a huge determinant of uh, cardiovascular health, we are finding out. And finally, you have a natural environment where you live, latitude, attitude. Um, sorry, I said attitude, but it's altitude, but certainly attitude also is a powerful determinant of what's called the exposome. So this is the sum totality of all the influences that uh, works to shape your responses, your physiologic responses uh, to influences around you. And if you were to examine pollutome, this is a huge aspect of research clearly, uh, because you know there's an aggregate set of chemicals in the environment around you, in air, water, and land, that can influence um, cardiovascular uh, outcomes and certainly metabolic outcomes. So the pollutome, in some ways, is a subset of the exposome. So if you wanted to measure this, and Phil Landrigan did a great job assembling a group of people uh, for the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Public Health, and this by all means stretches a remarkable piece of work because he really tried to uh, summarize the, the attributable risk to uh, all, uh, air poll all, all pollution influences, and this includes not only just uh, air pollution, but also water pollution, land pollution, to the extent that we can measure it. And part of the problem today is that we're not able to summarize the aggregate influences of um, pollutants that we experience every day. Simply sitting here in front of you today in my chair in an in a artificial environment, inhaling all kinds of indoor air pollutants is another uh, type of exposure. You know, eating out of a, a bag, uh, which which uh, which has uh, or a bottle, uh, a plastic bottle with bisphenols, is probably exposing me to another chemical exposure. So it's all around you. So to some extent, this is an underestimate. But having said that, 16% of all global deaths, when you measure it, is attributable to air, to environmental air pollution, and this is more than three times the deaths attributable to tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria combined. So just to give you an estimate of how important this is, and certainly 15 times larger than all wars and uh, violence combined. Now, if you look at this um, and, and you sort of zero in on air pollution, it's really the tip of the iceberg because what we know is, yes, air pollution kills. We know the air pollution causes heart attacks, strokes, um, and it certainly is a big part of all-cause mortality. But what we're also finding out is that there's lots of other associations, including things like heart failure, certainly a large body of evidence supporting metabolic disease, and again, areas where there's still inadequate evidence of association. And this could be a surrogate for any type of other exposure as well. So in some ways, I think air pollution is a prototypical exposure and allows you to, uh, to frame uh, the same types of questions for other aggregate exposures. So what do we know about the internal environment that we spoke about? Well, we know that the type of personality can influence um, you know, whether you develop hypertension or not. For instance, if you are type A, and you've got these types of uh, personality disorders. So many of us, unfortunately, in the medical community, especially in academic circles, suffer from uh, you know, this uh, complex problem of achievement, uh, striving, and competitiveness because we, we have to succeed. Uh, it's sort of almost uh, encoded in our DNA, to speak. And there is a significant association between things like traits like hostility, for instance, and certainly depression.
um, and time urgency, impatience, and future development of hypertension. And there's been some studies obviously showing that there is an association with mortality as well. Depression, we know, we well recognize that it's a very important surrogate. And this is a sum totality of many studies, a meta-analysis in 150,000 patients. And you can see the effect estimates here showing you that there is indeed uh, a very important uh, association, almost a two-fold increase in risk uh, to cardiovascular events uh, with underlying depression. Uh, so this, again, has uh, um, resulted in a whole plethora of investigations and interest in the mind-body connection and how you could alter cardiovascular risk. Sleep is an incredibly important determinant. You know, suffice to say that we understand this, um, you know, we understand um, very little of how sleep does it. This is a very nice study published in Jack last year, which used, leveraged the UK Biobank, which has, um, you know, a very robust data looking at um, sleep activity profiles in um, a large group of individuals. And when you look at um, genetic risk scores, and this is using um, um, conventionally uh, confirmed um, polymorphisms in large GWAS studies, including studies like cardiogram, and you look at what the association is or the interaction, if you will, of sleep duration with underlying genetic risk, just like the CARA paper, you find that if you have low genetic risk and you have a favorable uh, risk of sleep duration as a referent, then if you have high genetic risk for cardiovascular disease and you have um, favorable sleep duration, you can actually mitigate some of the risk. But on the other hand, if you have unfavorable sleep, in other words, you have shortened sleep or you have very long sleep and you have underlying genetic risk that really exponentially increases your risk even further. And they also did a Mendelian randomization studies using SNPs that have been associated with sleep duration. So the UK Biobank has had many papers now showing that there are many polymorphisms, mostly in the circadian rhythm cascade, that closely associate with sleep duration. Um, they also have associations between chronotype, for instance. In other words, if you wake up early, there are certain SNPs that determine whether or not you wake up early. So you can use these types of genotypes in order to ask a different question. So if you take these SNPs that are associated with sleep duration, in not only in cardiogram, but also um, in the UK Biobank, 26 SNPs, you can see there's a heightened risk for myocardial infarction. And again, if you add an additional hour of sleep, in other words, you slept a little bit more, that actually attenuates your risk. And this was confirmed in two different cohorts, not just the UK Biobank, but also with cardiogram. Again, emphasizing and underscoring the importance of sleep as a powerful mm -hmm. modulator of risk for cardiovascular. And this is a cartoon from the same paper showing that if you slept too little, there's a higher risk. And again, this is one of the problems being, um, uh, uh, you know, working in academic circles because you don't get enough sleep and we certainly are at risk for future myocardial infarction. So we'll have to find ways to mitigate the risk. And on the other hand, if you slept too much, there's also a heightened risk for cardiovascular events. And this is the Mendelian randomization study showing that this is, um, uh, you can mitigate the risk by taking some time to yourself and perhaps, you know, staying snuggled in in your bed uh, on the weekend. Now, so this slide summarizes what we know uh, about risk factors in the internal environment where uh, this is, again, a, a huge area, an opportunity, if you will, of really trying to understand mind-body interactions and how you can modulate cardiovascular health. Now, there is an emerging area of science uh, using modalities like um, um, PET or functional MRI that are starting to uncover the relationships between um, um, mental changes uh, as well as cardiovascular health. And this is data from um, Ahmed Tabakov, who published a very nice paper showing that if you use amygdalar activity as a prototypical, um, I guess, area of activation using PET FDG, and amygdalar activation is bad in the sense that it represents um, everything about the type A personality. So heightened amygdala is almost a surrogate for heightened sympathetic activation. And you can see that amygdala activity actually uh, correlates nicely with um, inventory survival. This is a small study in Boston you know, for uh, roughly 500 individuals. And importantly, there was a relationship between arterial inflammation, showing here in bone marrow activity, uh, with, uh, amygdala activi uh, with amygdala activation. So the idea is that CNS circuits, uh, once you get excited, there's heightened sympathetic activity, 
perhaps resulting in increased bone marrow activation and egress of bone marrow populations of cells. And this in turn predisposes you to atherosclerosis and cardiovascular events. So what do we know about the external environment? We know that where you live is a powerful determinant of how you die and what you die of. And this is sort of a reflection of cardiovascular event rates and zip codes and mortality. And you can see that right along the Mississippi, there's a huge uh, concentration. And the southern belt uh, is, is often um, an area that's enriched for cardiometabolic risk factors. We know that for a fact. We also know that where you live, um, may, is a huge determinant, um, and the greenness around you is a huge determinant of cardiovascular protection. So this is a UK study involving 41 million uh, Brits who were not retired. And the question was, depending on where you live or exposure to green space, does that modulate all-cause mortality and deaths from cardiovascular disease? And is there an interaction or is there, um, can you segregate these effects uh, based on income? So obviously, where you live is often determined by how much you make. So it, it's impossible to talk about green space without talking about socioeconomic indices, and income is one of them. And if you look at this, if you live in the most green area, there's approximately a 50% reduction um, in, in, in risk. Even though you might make a lot of money, um, and this is green as obviously people who make a lot of money, if you lived in an area where you're making a lot of money, but you also, there's a lot of, lot of greenery, you can markedly attenuate the risk. And it, it, it turns out that this reduction in all-cause mortality is primarily driven by cardiovascular mortality because you did not see this interaction of between exposure to green space and uh, deaths from lung cancer, for instance, or intentional self-harm because these were not associated with um, um, a greenness. So the green factor seems to powerfully modulate all-cause mortality and uh, to a large extent through cardiovascular causes. Now, I alluded to this at the beginning of my talk, where air pollution is obviously a very complex mixture, there are lots of different components, there are gaseous components, particulate components, but the component that almost always tracks very powerfully in study after study, after adjusting for just about everything, including socioeconomic disparities, is PM2.5. PM2.5 is a surrogate. Uh, these are particulate um, uh, matter, less than 2.5 microns. And the easiest way to quantify this is just to measure them, put them in a balance, and you measure the amount of exposure. And as I mentioned to you, the way to do this is through, uh, especially at a global level, um, is through an integrated exposure response curve, which is a simple way of saying the relationship between PM2.5 and um, uh, overall mortality on the y axis here. And this was the original exposure response curve used in the Global Burden of Disease document where they had to interpolate information because they did not have information like active smoking, et cetera, back when they put this curve together. More recently, uh, this model where they purely used outdoor air pollution studies shows you that there's a mildly supralinear relationship, meaning that more than linear at low levels. And as you can see, it keeps going up. At very high levels, 80 microgram is probably what you'll get in, um, you know, in, in South Asia, as well as countries like China. And there does not seem to be a lower threshold, neither does it seem to be an upper threshold, certainly no evidence of flattening of effects. So this tells you a couple of things, that even mitigating exposure at this level of exposure is important, is likely to be important, because previously people thought, gosh, you're flattening off at high levels. So if you're reducing from here to, let's say, here, it's not going to have a big difference. Yes, it does make a difference. It also makes a difference going down uh, at, at a lower level of exposure. The question is, how much can you do? Well, this is some Canadian data showing you that at very low levels, this is downright pristine, right? 4.5 microgram is absolutely pristine. And the question is, how much more can you, can you lower you know, this already pristine level? But the point that I was trying to make is there's still an association at very low levels of exposure between cardiovascular mortality and air pollution levels, suggesting that there's still some work to do even in this country. There's lots of different mechanisms. I'm not going to get into this. What we've learned over the last decade is that there is an uh, aspect of air pollution exposure where it modulates cardiovascular risk through intermediary uh, processes. In other words, it modulates the very risk factors that predispose individuals to cardiovascular events, including hypertension, diabetes, and, uh, and uh, things like chronic inflammation. So one question I keep getting asked is, well, you know, look, we know air pollution is bad for you, so let's just prevent everything 
reduce air pollution and be done with it. Why are you sitting studying air pollution? What's the, what's the, um, what's the rationale for doing this? And I would say, well, for one, it's very difficult to design chronic uh, air pollution studies of exposure. So you can't do that, unfortunately. And because this is a perennial risk factor that exposes people uh, across a lifetime. So human studies would necessarily have to rely on epi studies um, of some kind and obviously surrogate measures because you cannot tell me for a fact that there are other factors in the environment that closely uh, correlate and are collinear with exposure. And you cannot, there's absolutely no way to prove that. And you, you can't tell me that it's air pollution. And these are the naysayers who say, well, you don't know that. And I would say to you that it is, it is, uh, it is a very fair point because my friend Thomas Munzo, who, who lives close to um, the Frankfurt airport many years ago, uh, was, uh, was being disturbed every night because he couldn't sleep because there were these Lufthansa flights that would land right next to um, mines where he lives. And this completely was crazy. So he said, listen, there are 5,000 flights. The noise level is disrupted. And being you know, a very uh, determined German, Thomas said, I'm going to study noise air pollution, noise pollution, because this is really a problem. And it turns out that Thomas is right. Um, you know, noise does influence uh, cardiovascular health. And this is some recent data from uh, uh, Emma Tabakal again, showing you that noise indeed can increase amygdala activation. Here's amygdala activation in PET FDG studies. Again, using the same Boston cohort, these are patients who are cancer-free, who had the luxury of undergoing a PET FDG study. And again, if you look at the amygdala, there seems to be a very, a very good relationship between high levels of noise and amygdala activation. And again, this shows you that if you're exposed to greater than 45 decibels, you have a problem. And he also showed in mediation analysis that noise through amygdala activation and arterial inflammation might be predisposed to major adverse cardiovascular events. We know that air pollution exposure is associated with atherosclerosis. This is data from MESA that Dr. Nasir has done a tremendous amount of work on. And again, I don't have to introduce you to MESA, but essentially the study shows, uh, at least, and this is the MESA AIR study, which tried to understand the relationship between coronary artery calcium progression in the MESA cohort of roughly 7,000 patients who underwent repeat studies and air pollution. And there seems to be a modest association of 4.5 axis units and high levels for every five microgram per meter cube exposure. And you can look at the exposure response curve. Again, these are all quite low levels of exposure. And since COVID, this level has shifted even more further towards the left side of this graphic. We know that controlled exposure studies, there are many, many studies showing these types of things. You, you have an idling diesel engine and you have people exposed to uh, diesel exhaust and this in turn can increase blood pressures. You turn off the exposures. Um, this is the exposure shown here in gray. Once you stop exposures, blood pressures come back. And these are double blind randomized controlled studies. And Nick Mills has shown the same thing. There are many other people that have shown the same thing in animals and humans, et cetera. So short-term exposures can modulate metabolic health very powerfully. There are also studies showing that it can alter insulin resistance and certainly um, um, uh, metabolism. These are some recent um, uh, work from our uh, from our laboratory where we have access to long-term exposures where we expose animals to uh, months on end just to simulate uh, what the consequences are of um, long-term exposure in a way in which you can, you can measure it. And when you looked at genetic, uh, sorry, um, um, transcriptomics at various insulin responsive organs, you see a very stereotypic signature, uh, which is uh, one of pro-inflammatory uh, pro effects a multitude of uh, circadian rhythm genes, which is very interesting, as well as cancer progression and cardiometabolic pathways. And in some ways, exposure is very similar to a high-fat diet um, in some ways, uh, not in others, though. For instance, high-fat diet exposures, where, and we compared this in the same study, results in an increase in circadian rhythm, cause, also causes circadian rhythm disruption, and we know this quite well. And here is uh, a very classic circadian gene uh, called BMAL, which is downregulated and another circadian gene called RGS16, which is upregulated in the liver, suggesting that circadian disruption could be one pathway through which you can, can, uh, air pollution exposure could modulate cardiometabolic health. So in another study, we compared this with light disruption to see how does air pollution compare with a stimulus like um, exposure, um, you know, having the lights turned on at night. So these were mice that were exposed, just like human beings are, from Monday through Friday. Um, they would go back to their homes on the weekends. So it's like uh, a weekend commuter. Uh, 
go back and live at your home at relatively cleaner levels. And this is a filtered air exposure. This is a setup. And mice were randomized to either light at night or dark at night, which is a normal circadian cycle. And then we measured things like metabolic outcomes and PET FDG uptake. And what we found was a, a tremendous metabolic phenotype characterized by overt insulin resistance, uh, reduction in insulin sensitivity, and reduction in brown adipose tissue uptake of PET FDG. And there are lots of other changes. But importantly, what we found was evidence for circadian disruption, uh, not only in, in organs like the liver, but also in brown fat. And these are just two prototypical circadian genes, BMAL1 and CLOCK, showing you that there is uh, a huge change in not only the amplitude of mRNA expression, these are Zeitgeber times on the x-axis, and if you timed uh, gene expression at various times, you'll find that there's not only a decrease in amplitude with uh, air pollution exposure, uh, but it mimics what you see with um, uh, light at night exposure. And importantly, there's also a phase shift. And uh, when we looked at uh, epigenetic markers using a tax seq uh, we found that there were lots of different regions in the epigenome that were modulated by um, um, uh, PM2.5. And this is showing you different regions of the, um, and these are, this is the entire genome. Um, so these are differentially accessible regions looking at the five, five prime untranslated region, the three prime untranslated region, as well as the promoter regions where there were differences between um, uh, PM2.5 and filtered air. And this, I won't go into this in detail. So in the last few minutes, I just want to take a few minutes to uh, sort of talk about, you know, what this all means. And you might look at me and say, listen, you know, you, you're the perfect doomsday soothsayer who comes up and says, you know, it's all bad for you. So what, what can we do? The good news is I think we can do this. And as you could, uh, COVID-19 is a perfect storm, if you will, of reducing air pollution levels. This is reduction in air pollution levels across um, in China. And so this is an early paper. There are many, many others because this is an epidemiologist's dream in some ways because you have this perfect nat natural experiment that reduced air pollution exposures. Even in this country, we are still puzzled about why is it that we saw such a huge decrease in um, myocardial infarction admissions and stroke admissions, and people are still trying to figure it out. And a big uh, finger has been sort of been pointing at these environmental factors, you know, everything from commuting to work, uh, to air pollution exposures, to noise pollution exposures. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, at least in this study, in uh, Wuhan, for instance, there was a dramatic reduction in um, um, uh, cause-specific deaths, as you can see, and the vast majority of them are really cardiovascular. So air pollution levels fell, but with it was also a marked reduction in um, cardiovascular um, uh, to all-cause mortality, but specifically cardiovascular mortality. So there's emerging evidence that part of the um, um, COVID-19 silver lining could be some offsetting of COVID-19 mortality related to reductions in air pollution uh, modulated mortality, which is, which is an interesting area. So we've also learned, obviously, as I mentioned, that the rapid response and higher levels of compliance and commitment uh, shown in this crisis it shows us that we can change our behavior. There's no question we can do it. Um, and this is another very interesting experiment, uh, which is a thought experiment, if you will, if you turned off all anthropogenic sources of air pollution today, okay, how many deaths can you save? And this is a, a very nice paper by Joss Lelyveld, who again is in, um, uh, in Germany, who sort of uh, did this very elaborate, uh, elaborate exercise of computing what would happen. And if you turned off just fuel uh, emissions, you can save 3.61 million deaths a year. And if you turned off all anthropogenic sources, which include just not only fossil fuels, but other sources of energy, you can save roughly 5.55 million deaths a year. So this is not a trivial amount. And importantly, the elimination of fossil fuels related in all anthropogenic pollution can have a tremendous impact on um, environmental um, effects. And this is just looking at uh, 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 rainfall, for instance, because once you change particulates, it dramatically changes the hydrologic cycle. So areas of the world which are constantly deprived for water can see a surfeit of water. And this is this map, the heat map demonstrates the fractional change in precipitation by removal of fossil fuel related and anthropogenic sources. So there's a tremendous benefit, ecological benefit of reducing uh, air pollution levels. Now, again, this is a thought experiment. I doubt that this is going to be done and we're going to switch off our emissions tomorrow. 
But certainly, I think this should catalyze us to think about alternative sources of emissions. And this is already being thought out. Europe, for instance, is thinking about an $890 billion investment for shifting to green energy uh, sources or fuel sources. And this could be one of the other silver linings of COVID-19. But again, this is not simple. This is an incredibly complex exercise. And this slide, I think, does not do justice for the amount of things that you might need to do to reduce emissions, right? Um, but again, you know, this is obviously at a societal, governmental level. It requires legislation. It requires supervision. It requires policing. It requires laws. So what can you do as an individual? Well, from a personal protection equipment perspective, and you've heard a lot about that in COVID-19, there's obviously a lot of things you could do. You can wear a mask, very effective in reducing air pollution levels. You can use a home filter. Turns out to be very effective in reducing indoor and outdoor exposures. And in many countries, indoor exposures are a reflection of the outdoor ambient environment. And obviously, you can change your commute, you can exercise, you can do a lot of different things. And there's emerging data that there's a lot of benefit when you start to look at uh, surrogates, uh, when you start doing this. Unfortunately, if you don't have any study that has yet evaluated the efficacy on hard outcomes, it's something it's hard to do. But we just had an NHLBI um, um, uh, conference to sort of evaluate the, the potential of doing a large event-driven study to reduce exposure. But certainly COVID-19 has created uh, a, a little bit of a, um, how should I say, a challenge because everybody's wearing masks now, at least you're supposed to be. And that can uh, sort of, um, uh, um, um, how should I say, uh, muddy the water, if you will. So in conclusion, I think um, the, the thing that you could do uh, is to look at the environment in a holistic sense, uh, look at healthy behaviors and a focus on health rather than disease. Obviously, a big focus on psychosocial function and ways in which you can ameliorate the internal environment in addition to the external environment should be an important focus in the years to come. So I'd like to conclude by thanking you know, the folks that I've worked with. I've really you know, done very little. It's only a stand here because of people, my collaborators, who've really been an incredible resource and, and, a, and a family, if you will, of people interested in the environment. And I, I think uh, I'm so delighted to actually be working with people like Kuam, who's also interested in, in similar uh, pursuits. So again, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, Sanjay, thank you so much. This was a fascinating journey, and I would say one of the most important yet in clinical practice, say almost completely ignored factor. Now, with the evidence that we have, where do you see the disparities in how as healthcare practitioners, why we haven't yet adopted assessment of environmental factors. As you know, it's becoming more clear to us that individuals where they are born, they grow, they live, they work, and age may impact much more than the clinical factors. So in your opinion, what would it take for us as healthcare practitioners to adopt evaluation and maybe addressing some of these important and critical factors? No, great question. And we struggle with that very much, Karam. But I think in a broader sense, this uh, sort of highlights the, uh, the, the focus on the individual, which it should be. You know, we're trying to, most of our patients are high risk. We're trying to talk about their cholesterol, get them to take the medications, which is a huge problem. And, you know, at the same time, fight the electronic medical record. So, you know, it, it's kind of a little disingenuous if I were to suggest you now start talking about the environment and start talking about air pollution when I'm already not doing the things that I should, should be doing or educating people on lifestyle. So it's, it's very hard. It's a complex problem. By no means stretch is it, um, is it easy. But having said that, this uh, air pollution is simply a surrogate. The environment is simply a surrogate for all the other conversations that we not have. We're not having conversations about sleep. Not having conversations about things that they can do to improve their metabolic health. We scarcely talk to our patients about, you know, lifestyle. We relegate it to somebody else, and that's you know part of the reality of the environment that we live in. No pun intended, uh, because the uh, reimbursement uh, practices, everything that we do is focused on what I think could be far more, uh, you know, holistic. But in order to get there, I think technology is going to be our huge friend. The only way we can think about this is to integrate these types of influences to the holistic assessment of an individual. And you can't do this. And this is not something that my mind can do. This has to be through, you know, um, 
uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence approaches where the sum totality of what you're doing or, or, or in your environment is, is integrated into your assessment of the patient in a holistic sense. So I think there's lots of research and lots of opportunities, if you will, of integrating uh, mechanisms so that it becomes second nature to you. It's not, you know, it's provided to you rather than you having to dig out, you know, how much the patient is sleeping, you know, what the exposures are. Is he, you know, did he have a bad childhood? These are things that you don't even think about. So I think the, the lesson, lesson that I'm trying to say, and I think this was a long answer to your short question, is that um, we have to get to a point where we are able to discuss the environment in a, in a, in a meaningful way uh, with the patient. In order to do that, we need a lot of help from technology. But I do think we live in a golden era where these kinds of things are you know, developing very rapidly. And through refinements in technology, we might find ourselves in the lucky situation of integrating this and providing a holistic solution to the, to the patient, which can be good, not only for the individual, but for society. So, you know, that's definitely with rapid accumulation of data and digital tools coming in, I, I, I see that eventually we'll be getting there where we'll have the capacity to take information from all these sources, put it together and come up with a more holistic evaluation. But even today, it's clear to us that your zip code provides more information than your genetic code. Right. Now, do you think there may be more applications for patients, for example, coming in for cardiovascular risk assessment where addition of that can further risk stratify whether they may be at a higher risk or not? And how would you envision for health systems to just take that very simple five digit zip code information and tell more about a patient about their risk and potential opportunities uh, to manage them? No, great question. It's obviously a complicated question because although at a population level, you know, zip codes are clearly associated with health risk, there are also lots of, uh, you know, overlap, you know, lots of, uh, and there's again, the shifting uh, trends of where people uh, decide to live or where they think they should be living. There's a huge migration, as you know, from the suburbs back to urban areas. There is, um, you know, because those are more desirable areas to live in. So I think a simplistic way of doing that would probably, um, you know, um, um, not be the, um, the, the way I would recommend. But nevertheless, what you're trying to bring up, which really is a great point, which is, is there any way you could flag patients through a variety of different criteria, including their zip codes, perhaps their socioeconomic um, deprivation index, or other indices, or that before they see you, before they come to you in clinic, you sort of flag them as somebody who needs extra attention, who needs, you know, uh, maybe they don't have insurance, maybe they don't have other aspects uh, that we take for granted, where we could identify them and then really cater to make sure that their needs are being taken care of. But that's, uh, you know, it's almost like a social experiment. And we live in health systems where you know, we have to make that a priority and we have to make that a priority because uh, and there's an economic argument to do that, which is which is to say that these individuals often contribute to excessive healthcare expenditures. So by addressing gaps in healthcare for those very individuals, you can actually, uh, you know, turn this into a profitable argument. So that's what I would say uh, to you. But I think you're right on. I, I absolutely agree that, you know, using such simple uh, readily available data uh, would be one way to start thinking about how do you priori prioritize um, you know, resources and how do you prioritize visits, et cetera. So an another area is that you see a lot of advertisements these days around supplements that can help reduce pol pollutants in your vascular system in, uh, in your body. What's your thoughts about that? Should would we be moving in that direction? We have seen some evidence, at least from the chelation therapies, from, from, from first of the initial RCTs that surprisingly did show some signal, positive signal, especially in the diabetic patients. Do you think eventually we'll get to a point where these therapies may potentially become mainstream? Great question. Um, you know, I, I sort of have, um, um, you know, chelation therapy is obviously a little controversial. Um, I think the, um, the idea is simple enough, but how, however, you know, there have been many important examples where 
uh, you know, therapies with the best intentions have unintended consequences, especially when you don't know what they do. So I remain very interested. Obviously, I think there's a randomized controlled clinical trial that will tell us whether this is uh, important. Uh, you know, another way of dealing with this is to really understand, um, you know, sources and to understand where the sources are and sort of have a targeted effort. Uh, I think, um, you know, taking a pill is great. Um, I think um, there have been small experiments suggesting at least with surrogates at certain types of approaches, you know, including things like statins, et cetera, might, might be beneficial. Um, however, I think um, the more important question is, you know, how do you deal with the, the problem in the first place, I think. Um, but potentially, to your question, could there be other modalities that could target certain types of exposures? It's possible, certainly possible. Perfect. Uh, so let me see. We don't have any more questions here today, but Sanjay, this was fascinating. We truly look forward to collab collaborating more with you. This is a space that's not well tapped in, and we truly need to understand this whole comprehensive social determinants and environmental determinants that goes beyond our traditional risk factor assessment. But thank you so much for your fascinating insights, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Take care. Thank, thank you, Karam. It's been a pleasure.